Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into into a place, a zone zone called called the the alternative alternative to the alternative alternative media. media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Affirmative. Okay, Greg Anthony here, and glad you are back on the investigative journal on this July 5th, 2017 day on our calendar. And today I want to talk about an old story I did about Philip Kronzer. And I'll get into it in a minute, but I do want to mention two things. One, I'm running a pledge drive all month. And uh, please help us out here. And you can donate by going to ARCTICBEACON.com. And you can get shows going back well over a decade regarding what I call the Vatican led New World Order on the show that's been called The Alternative to the Alternative Media. Now, uh, If you go right now to Arctic Beacon, it's still there. I'm going to, in the process of dismantling it and changing over to a WordPress site with the help of Nicholas Arthur from the station here. And he's doing a heck of a job in uh, getting this for me. And I really appreciate it. Uh, The the site that's up there now, it's just in its infant stages, is called greganthonysjournal.wordpress.com. And we're going to migrate everything over there, revamp it, give it a new facelift, and have a more interactive website. So hopefully that will increase listenership. And uh, also it will increase people wanting to keep this show on the air, correct? So in the meantime, you can still go to Arctic Beacon, hit the Donate button, and uh, let's see what we can do this month. Okay, what I want to do now is talk about... Philip Kronzer. And, you know, I was thinking about this guy today because, you know, right now I'm looking out into a tree and there's a Mother Mary apparition, right? I see Mother Mary in a tree. And so now I'm going to go around and tell all these people in the community that I've seen a miracle. And then the Vatican's going to send over a bunch of priests to, uh, you know, legitimize it or to say it's a hoax. Then they'll probably try to bribe me and uh, pay me a lot of money to say that it was true, and then I'll become, uh, you know, like those kids from Portugal. In the long run, they'll end up killing you because they don't want any traces of their lives. And so these Mother Mary apparitions, which to me are all fake, came to light in a story that I did with Phil Kronzer in 2006. Now, what I'm going to do is instead of telling you the whole story... I'm going to play that interview I did with him, and then I'm going to fill in the blanks on what's happened to him in the recent years. It's an incredible story, and it shows you the duplicity, the deceit of the Vatican and their bishops. So let's go right now. Let's not waste any time. I did this in June of 2006, and I'm trying to figure out exactly where I was in June of 2006. And I'll be doing that while I'm listening to the show here because I, frankly, have forgotten a little bit about it. But I know uh, Kronzer's story well, so let's get right to it. Good. Journal. I'm your host, Greg Szymanski, here from 2 to 4, and what a guest I have today. They call him the Cult Buster. That's Phil Kronzer, and you're going to want to listen to this uh, interview coming up after uh, I give a brief introduction here of several issues I have to clean off of my desk, and then we'll get to Philip Kronzer, and uh, we'll get to an uh, interview about religious fraud, about a number of other things involving the Vatican and other religious uh, organizations that have been infiltrated. And we were going to talk about this with Philip Kronzer, so you stay tuned for this interview. And remember, if you want to get a copy of it, I'm even telling you now, you're going to want to live if you miss it. Uh, go to our archive section. That's rbnlive.com. You can go to archive. Okay, you can't get it there anymore because they kicked me off the radio station. And they got rid of a lot of my uh, archives. Yeah. But anyway, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to play. I'm going to skip what I was saying there and get right to Phil Kronzer. 
investigative journal. I'm your host, uh, Greg Szymanski, and uh, today we're going to talk to Philip Kronzer. Once he gets back on the line, his phone dropped out, so we'll give Phil a nice introduction here until we get him back on the line. Mr. Producer, let me know. Phil was just there, but anyway, Phil Kronzer started this foundation called the Philip Kronzer Foundation for Relig Religious Re Research back in 2001, and in his words, he did it for this reason. Each year, thousands of people endure mental and physical sufferings due to the deceptive, deceitful, and mind-numbing effects of religious fraud. Unfortunately, myself, and this is Phil talking, and my family recently fell victim to a group who took advantage of us. When he finally realized we had been manipulated, when Phil did, my, his business was destroyed, as well as his 39-year marriage to his lovely wife, Artie. And with that, uh, Phil Kronzer started a foundation uh, that is doing some good, good things. And Phil, how are you today? Are you back? About that. Are you there, Phil? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you dropped off the line there for a minute. I gave you an introduction, but let's tell us how this... Uh, Philip Crownzer Foundation for Religious research, research began, and why you did that? Well, I formed a foundation in uh, early 2001. Uh, I was in a long, uh, many multi-year battle with uh, a cult, uh, which uh, evolves around the uh, apparition site, uh, the alleged apparition site of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Medjugorje, which is a small village in Bosnia Herzegovina, not too far from Mostar. Uh, my wife, Ardith, or uh, Ardie for short, A-R-D-I-E, um, uh, we were married for 39 years when she disappeared uh, on June 30th of 1994. Uh, Ardie and I have been involved uh, with uh, these uh, apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary since 1987 in, uh, in Bosnia. And then, of course, it evolved into uh, getting involved with some other people who were also called so-called visionaries, but everything seemed to uh, spin off of Medjugorje. I uh, didn't know it at the time, but uh, Medjugorje was a, was a total fraud. That uh, was from the beginning and uh, still is today. It's a literally a uh, billion dollar ripoff. Uh, my wife had been uh, involved with... Uh, now you're a Roman Catholic, correct? Uh, yes, yeah, so I was born and raised uh, Roman Catholic in Wisconsin. Um, my family on both sides was Roman Catholic. And uh, in Wisconsin, by the way. I was born in Two Rivers. Wow, do you ever hear of a place called Burlington? Yes. My dad had a dairy farm there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I grew up in a place called Burlington, Wisconsin for a number of years. Beautiful place. Go ahead. Yes. Well, I went to school in Manitowoc, and I went to high school in Sheboygan, and moved to California in 1952. Okay. Uh, so we had been involved in, in prayer groups in, in Medjugorje and uh, different visionaries, and people came and stayed at our house in California. I have a house in Los Gatos, or I had a house in Los Gatos, which I lost after my wife, uh, they got her to divorce me. <clears throat> had a 5,000 square foot house in Los Gatos, had a house in Carmel near the beach, and uh, my family has been absolutely demolished and devastated by this whole situation. And how did you get led out to uh, uh, Bosnia? Tell us that. Well, how did this begin? Well, we'd already been to Europe many times before in 1987. To uh, We went to Lourdes five times. Uh, we're in Fatima a few times, uh, and some of the other uh, uh, more pretty approved uh, shrines. So we've been near Europe uh, about 18, 20 times uh, prior to 1987. Um, I, you know, I, you know, I was a businessman, and we had ran a, a company in Campbell, California. We were very, very successful, and, and we could travel a lot. So uh, we got involved in Major Boy in 87 when we first heard about it, and uh, you know, it's totally believable. Here you have this uh, village in the middle of nowhere, just nothing but uh, rock, rock, rocky hill country, and, and uh, we heard about it, and it was quite fascinating. And for us at that time, it was still uh, pretty much under the communist rule. And uh, But we read up on it and got uh, talking to some other people who had been there, so we decided to go. We well, tell, to our, tell our listeners what, uh, what's go what was uh, going on in, in Medjugorje. In 1981, uh, it is actually, in fact, June 25th, uh, the Feast of John the Baptist, St. John the Baptist, 25th, the, uh, there were six children in Medjugorje that allegedly uh, had an apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Actually, on the first day, there were, I think there were uh, two girls and one boy, and then eventually, the, the, the second day, there were four girls and two boys. Uh, that, that's where it started. Uh, they were quite young at the time. The youngest uh, uh, visionary, his name was Yaakov. He was about nine or ten years old. 
Uh, the pastor of St. James the Church there at the time was a Padre Yozo Zavko, and the assistant pastor was a uh, priest by the name of Thomas Vlasic. Um, that's where it started, and uh, the way that the way it goes, the story goes that Yozo Yozavko was out of town at the time, and when he came back about three days later, all this uh, thing had, had been transpiring, and a word got out, and within a week they had uh, uh, big crowds of people showing up. There's tape recordings of what happened on the first the first week of, of what really took place, and the, the children were asked, uh, "Well, what did Our Lady say?" Well, she's uh, she came to she, she was talking to us about certain things. They said, "Well, did she say how long she would be here?" And it, it, as it ended up, after about three or four days, the answer was, "Well, she said she would be here just as long as as we want her to be." Well, we've got information um, uh, of what really happened at the beginning. In fact, there's a book written by E. Michael Jones, uh, who is from South Bend, Indiana. And E. Michael Jones uh, had Fidelity Magazine, now he calls it Culture Wars. Jones uh, had, uh, ended up writing a book called The Medjugorje Deception, and he and I worked together in 1997 time frame uh, when he was writing that book. What, what happened is it was a charismatic meeting that took place in Rome uh, just six weeks prior to uh, that June date of 1981. And uh, it was a large charismatic gathering. There was a, a priest by the name of Father Emil Tardif, who I believe he's deceased now. But he had some kind of a vision, and he said that he, he saw uh, uh, this Thomas Lawrence Vlasic, that Our Lady was going to come and and uh, and protect you and, and defend you. And see, there was a, there was some real bad blood at that time between the Franciscan province of, of Mostar, which was where Medjugorje was. And the secular, the uh, the, the diocesan uh, priest of a bishop Zanich at the time, the Franciscans were supposed to uh, turn over uh, parishes to the uh, to the bishop in Mostar, and uh, they refused to do it. It's a lot of a lot of politics and a lot of uh, uh, you know the Croatian uh, nationalism, you know, and this feeling that they have. So there was, there's always been a battle raging there. Well, you know, uh, you mentioned at the top of the hour you were taken in on this uh, supposed fraud, and your wife was also. Right. She disappeared. Tell us about that. How did that happen? Then we'll get back into the story. Okay, well, it, it actually took some time. From 1987 until 1994, uh, there were, we were involved with Medjugorje and other uh, prayer groups and other apparitions besides. We also went uh, around 1992 to uh, Spain to uh, Garen Bendol, which was another alleged apparition side. Well, what the, the bottom line is, my wife got into it deeper and deeper, and I more or less uh, sat on the sidelines, and, and I became a little bit suspect, but actually where, where, where she got in trouble, she got involved with, with a visionary, a fake visionary from Denver called Teresa Lopez, and Teresa Lopez came on the scene around 1992, and see, the, what happened is the war broke out in Bosnia in, around Medjugorje in uh, 1991. Uh, the Civil War, and then people weren't going there because it was too dangerous. So uh, these same people who were promoting these apparitions decided that uh, they would uh, move Medjugorje temporarily to Denver, Colorado, which uh, they set up Teresa Lopez, and she was up on the mountain by the Mother Cabrini Shrine, and she was drawing crowds of 10,000 on a weekend. So it was just a continuation to keep uh, this whole thing going. My wife got in head over heels, with this group, and she also got involved with a woman, her name is Marcia Smith, and the two of them were, were involved in all of this, and of course, it, it just, I was being more or less the odd man out, and I wasn't being told everything that was going on, and in 1993, in November, uh, my wife, Artie, was invited to a retreat in the, in the mountains uh, near Denver, at that place called Snow Mountain Ranch, that's where she met up with group of people that were under the leadership of a bishop, Pavel Nilitsa. And Nilitsa was uh, from that a Jesuit group. A Jesuit, right, right. You know yeah. something, Phil? I just want to interject here for our listeners, because where this story goes, uh, this started out as a personal issue that uh, basically destroyed your life, correct, Phil? Right, exactly. Was, right. And what it's done from here is grown, because you served, uh, your research has served for many people that I've talked to, one, Jonathan Levy, the attorney who sued the Vatican, and these tentacles of these cults go, 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 they stretch out a long way all over this world, and you've been really 
really uh, uncovering some unbelievable things. So get back to Milica because this guy's come up a couple times in the Vatican uh, bank scandal, billions of dollars being uh, laundered and never found. And uh, he serves as a, per a person involved in that. So go ahead. That name is interesting. Well, let's focus on him then for the time being because uh, he first, uh, based on documents in my possession, uh, he was pretty much uh, introduced in, into the Denver area of uh, 1990, late 91, early 92. He had a, uh, a, a secretary working for him by the name of Luciano Alamande. Mm -hmm. Luciano was from Rome, okay. and, and he was his secretary. At the time, uh, at, at the beginning in 91, he was not an ordained priest. And... Uh, when I was not ordained, Luciano or Luciano, no? Luciano. They're, they're, well, first of all, getting back to Nielsa, there's a lot of mystery as to where he really came from and how he became a bishop. Uh, he was out of cheek. He was born in Czechoslovakia, as far as we know, and then um, he was uh, ordained a priest. I don't know the exact year, but uh, shortly after being ordained a priest, within really, literally months, he was consecrated a bishop. And there's a lot of controversy, and there's several different stories, versions of how he was actually consecrated. Okay, Phil, we're going to take a break right now and get back uh, with you in three minutes. You're listening to the Investigative Journal and the Republic Broadcasting. Bob, uh, tell them everything's broken, and we're going to try to fix it here on the Investigative Journal. My guest is Phil Kronzer. He started a group called the Kronzer Foundation for Religious Research. He's nicknamed the Cult Buster. His work includes uh, trying to under trying to uncover just what has happened in the Catholic faith as well as in other religions and what has happened in our government, what has happened in other governments. Has someone really asked the question, has someone, has some organization, some group infiltrated these groups to bring about a new world order, to bring about war across the country? Phil, uh, am I off base? I've interviewed so many people that have been telling me that. I've been trying to get to the bottom of it. What do you think? Uh, the bottom of the, uh, yeah, the situation in the church today, in the Catholic Church? The situation in all, possibly all religions have been Absolutely, yes, it's not an attack on Christianity. And, uh, There's definitely a connection to a world order. And why don't we'll get back to that major question after we get into the particulars. I want to finish up, uh, you were talking about Bishop Nilica, his relationship to this, uh, to Medjugorje, and also perhaps a more involved relationship in the Vatican. And don't forget to finish up the story about your personal uh, story of you and your wife. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, well, Bishop Neil said that. Let's get back to that. He was connected with a group uh, called Pro Fatribus at one time. That goes back into the 1960s. And by the time uh, I got to know who he was, uh, they changed the name of the group to Pro Deo et Fratribus. And Luciano Alamande, who I mentioned earlier, was uh, his secretary. Uh, I didn't find out about all of this until uh, oh, a year or so after my wife disappeared, uh, and uh, I started digging in and uh, doing my investigation over in Denver. Uh, and Nielitz, again, was a consecrated bishop very early after he was ordained a priest, uh, and he uh, had a lot of connections with the Vatican. In fact, he was a very close uh, friend of John Paul II, yeah. and that's true, he was. Uh, and uh, Luciano, uh, in 1991, was on the West Coast uh, traveling in California, and he was trying to find a seer or a visionary that he could form a spiritual uh, union with. That was the word we got. And he uh, met up with a woman uh, called Christine Muggers from Santa Rosa, California. Eventually, he went with Christine Muggers to Denver, and that's where they found this woman called Teresa Lopez. And Lopez became uh, the seer in, in Denver. Uh, and she was part of Nielsen's group. She literally became the private seer for the pro and Fratribus movement under Nielsen and his guidance. They formed a, uh, a, a group called CEM, Catholic Evangelization Mission for Russia, right in Denver. And it was a fellow by the name of Dick Hertzsche who wrote the business plan, and I've got a copy of the business plan. Uh, they were going to raise $200 million. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, the Luciano Alamande, uh, in 1992, I have a letter in my possession where he got an entree into the National Conference of Catholic Bishops in Washington, D.C. Uh, he wrote a letter to a, a fellow in uh, Denver called Scott, named Scott White, 
and I have that letter, and he said that Bishop Korich, K-O-R-E-C, uh, got him an introduction for a meeting with the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, and in fact, uh, just before he left Rome, he, he had a meeting with John Paul II's uh, secretary discussing this whole arrangement. So they, they ended up uh, coming to Denver, setting up CEM, Catholic, Catholic Evangelization for Russia, with a $200 million business plan. It was all fraud. Teresa Lopez, we found out, had married, been married five times. She had abandoned a couple of children. Uh, her last husband was Jeff Lopez. Uh, she was a, a heavy drinker, and she was on drugs. And uh, when Luciano first came uh, to Denver, he was not a priest. They, they tried to get into the, uh, uh, the conference in Notre Dame. What had happened at Notre Dame University, uh, they had they would have been holding uh, charismatic conferences there every year, around usually around May, uh, since the early 80s. And then by 1980, The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. 
visit crossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The following program is legally dangerous and off limits by the supreme Jesuit command. But stand tall, people. Listen up, and you may just learn something. Okay, we are back for the second half hour of the investigative journal. And boy, that was really weird because in the last few minutes, the audio just was all screwed up. It was as if my internet connection was going in and out, but it showed that it was uh, very solid. But anyway, I think I solved the problem. So let's get back to this interview with Phil Kronzer. And let me say this I was trying to explain something. Phil was a very wealthy Catholic. And when I knew Phil, he still was under the impression that there was a good side of the Vatican and a bad side. And of course, there are a lot of good Catholic people. But Phil got embroiled in this Mechagori hoax. And basically, what they, they targeted him because he was a very wealthy businessman. And what they did is they targeted him, spread lies to his wife, and then got all his money. And he tried to get to the bottom of it and uh, went through enormous amount of pain and suffering. And I'm telling you, he was targeted once he, you know, he spent millions of dollars trying to get to the truth to clear his name. And uh, basically, he was then charged with a number of crimes. He had to flee the country. He, he would call me sometimes from certain locations outside of the country and uh, would not divulge exactly where he was at. And... Uh, they wanted to put an end to him because he, he hired private investigators, spent money showing the fraud and what they did to him and his family and how they basically took over his wife and, made, and spread lies about Phil so that they could get his money. And, uh, boy, he did lose most everything. So let's get back to Phil Kronzer. Uh, fellows, to, to Fatima, and he had them ordained... On December 8th of 1992, right in the shrine of Bikova, in Fatima, in the wee hours of the morning, he had a bishop that he brought in from, I believe Czechoslovakia, I don't remember the name of the bishop right offhand, but he did the ordination. Now, the word we had is none of these guys ever went to a seminary. So, uh, and Luzan and Teresa Lopez, the so-called seer, was there at the ordination. Well, there were some things going on between Luciano and uh, Teresa Lopez that weren't quite right. And then we knew that because we had witnesses to it. So this was a total scam. Well, listen, Phil, um, let me take another break. Uh, we'll continue on with your story in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. <laughs> recently. Well, I think it's good you talk about these things and are educating a lot of people, I think. If you haven't already, you should listen to the complete Mystery Babylon series of broadcast by William Cooper. And for those of you who don't know who William Cooper is, he was a longtime activist who so years ago was started talking about the same things uh, that we're talking about today, about the New World Order, about its tentacles being all over the world, uh, governments, religious groups being infiltrated. Well, anyway, Mr. Cooper uh, was killed in a strange incident, uh, and we're going to talk about that. But uh, anyway, the emailer goes on to say it's 41 hours long. That's Mystery Babylon, and very comprehensive. It's available on Torrent or and legally through his site, Hour of the Time. They killed him, so be 
careful. Well, anyway, last week I had scheduled an interview tomorrow with Doyle Shamley. And those of you who don't know who Doyle is, he now uh, broadcasts hour at a time in William Cooper's name, was a best friend of William Cooper, and was right beside him for all the years that they gathered research. Doyle's going to be with us tomorrow, give us the straight story from his side about how William Cooper was killed, and uh, don't miss that interview tomorrow on the uh, Republic Broadcasting Network from 2 to 4 in the Investigative Journal. Phil, let's get back to your story. Uh, you were talking about how this group, uh, the Medjugorje people, uh, moved to Denver, how Nilica and all these people infiltrated uh, uh, this, uh, using this as a front. Get, get to, uh, just, just before we get back to the particular, what's the point of them doing this from your research? Go ahead. Well, it's always money, number one. Uh, money and power. Uh, Nina's, uh, uh, we have a, a woman by the name of Anna Marie Schmidt. She's uh, quite elderly, but she uh, she came from, uh, I'm not sure exactly where she came from in Europe, but I believe Germany or somewhere in there. But see, she knew Nielsa from before, and through a very good friend of mine, a, a very good nun, uh, Sister Philip Marie Burley, Anna Marie Schmidt identified Nielsa as a KGB operative from years ago. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Again, it was all money. They had the $200 million business plan set up in Denver, and they had this uh, big visionary, Teresa Lopez, who was all set up, and uh, uh, she, they, would, they would ended up going to the Mother Cabrini Shrine, which is up near Golden, Colorado, and there's a retreat center up there, and they were drawing crowds as many as 10,000 people on a weekend, so they were, they were rolling in the money. Rolling in the money. Exactly. Then Lopez, Teresa Lopez ended up, she came to San Francisco, South San Francisco, I believe it was about June of 1993, and my wife and I were still together, and everything was, everything was fine, and we went, we went to that uh, conference, and uh, I was there when Lopez was up uh, uh, speaking, and without a script for an hour, she went uh, on and on, and I even believed her. I mean, I literally, uh, uh, you know, she, she was more of mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. And we even had a video of it that we brought home and, and uh, well, wanted to show it to our, to our children. I've got three grown children. All of our children are in their 40s. Now they don't talk to me because I've been declared insane. insane. That's how they do it to you. Okay. Anyway, we got into that in, 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 uh, in June. And then uh, my wife went on this retreat that I was talking about. This was in November of 1983. And she went with this woman, Marcia Smith, and I wasn't invited. And they were in uh, a snow mountain ranch in, in the the hills, uh, the mountains uh, above Denver, and she came back, and I didn't know, I didn't know her. I mean, she, she her eyes looked funny, and she was acting very strange, and, and uh, she started picking fights. Then they had another retreat in California in uh, January of 1994, and Nielitsa came out with another one of his phony priests, a guy by the name of Paul Sigel, and they had this weekend retreat, and I got the video of that, and I mean, it's, it definitely it was nothing but mind control. People, they were literally chanting the rosary. You could see what was going on. And then in uh, May of 94, they took my wife, Artie, to Notre Dame for another uh, a conference and, and a special retreat. And I wasn't invited. She was gone for about six days. And we have a video of that where Artie is on stage with this Marcia Smith woman, and they're giving testimony on behalf of Bishop, uh, Bishop Pavel Nielitsa. And Nielitsa was supposed to be... They were introducing him as the spiritual leader of the entire Medjugorje movement all across the United States. And this was at the Notre Dame Conference? Notre Dame Conference. They finally got into that then. They, yeah, they finally got in. Once they, once they got these guys ordained, they got some credibility, and, and they worked their way in. Then there was a sister, Emmanuel Millard, uh, who was also in Medjugorje. She had a, uh, was, was involved with the group of nuns called the Beatitudes. Now, that's an order that Bishop Bradko Perich and, and most are uh, banned from Medjugorje, but, but he can't get them to leave because they just don't listen to what he says. I met Bishop Perich back in 1998. He's a very good man. Um, so here we had this Lopez thing, and they were uh, we had the video of my wife up on stage. Uh, Marcia Smith wrote the script, and my wife, you could see that she was under total mind control. There was no question about it. And, and at the end of that, they raise their rosaries and say, uh, the, to the triumph, okay? And then Nielitsa, they kneel down and, and Bishop Nielitsa prays over them. So I showed that uh, video to my children about a year after the fact, and they, they went ballistic. But eventually they got my, my children to uh, turn against me, and uh, they, they believe their mother. It's, it's, 
What they can do with mind control on this stuff, Greg, is absolutely unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, what eventually happened to your wife? Well, I say she literally disappeared on June 30th. I came back from Carmel. I was in a golf outing uh, with, with uh, my son-in-law and my son and, and a customer. And I came back and I came home to empty closets and I couldn't, we couldn't find her for three months. And but, when you did find her, what happened? Well, what happened is this Marcia Smith woman had literally uh, uh, leased an, uh, a condominium for her, uh, set everything up under her, her own maiden name, and uh, uh, set us everything up, and she had her tucked away and, and hidden. We had zero contact with her for the first three months, and my, my daughter Cindy and my son Mike uh, uh, were, uh, were going crazy over the whole situation. I mean, I, they thought I was going to commit suicide. I mean, I was devastated. 39-year marriage, and it's just thing out of the blue, she's gone. And we all knew that she was acting kind of strange for several months before that, but we just couldn't put our finger on it. Right. But she was under total mind control. So then she leaves. Uh, the children and you are aligned together. Right, two of them and my son. My son, Doug, it was estranged at the time from his brother and sister anyway, so he was kind of odd man out. But Cindy and Mike, uh, we, we, we got into this thing together to figure out they finally, at the end of September, found her up at Marcia Smith's house and went up to see her and tried to get her to leave. And after about 20 minutes, uh, Marcia Smith just literally uh, uh, put her into her vehicle, her Jeep, and then and, and drove off. Uh, she wasn't about to leave. She couldn't focus her eyes. She had lost about 15 pounds. And believe me, she didn't have 15 pounds to lose. So uh, it, we, we were just, we were beside ourselves. So eventually, uh, she did come out and meet with my children. But prior to that, I got a, uh, she, she hired a female divorce attorney from Palo Alto, California, by the name of Cheryl Cassidy. We find out now that Cheryl Cassidy is a card-carrying member of Call to Action, and she wants to be ordained a priest. They call her Ms. Catholic. Mm -hmm. They also call her the liquidator. She's got a reputation for breaking up uh, assets and, 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 uh, and, and disposing of everything. And to see what they're doing, there's no question what's going on out here in, in this Silicon Valley atmosphere. They're literally breaking up marriages and the real estate brokers and, and the divorce attorneys are laughing all the way to the bank. It's a racket. I see what that is. So they're breaking up your marriage and they get your assets, correct? Exactly. I, I lost $5 million just on two houses because they were sold, they were sold by court order. And in September of, of 1994, Artie's attorney uh, told my accountant, because I didn't even hire an attorney at the time, he told my accountant, well, besides the, uh, the money that... Uh, that Mr. Kronzer is paying her every month, which we paid her immediately. There was no argument about well, There was no way to repair this marriage. Then. Well, there wasn't even a talk of counseling or reconciliation of any kind. We didn't even have access to her. And you see, to me, let's say uh, you're looking uh, now, you're trying to mount a defense. I mean, they're going to just say, hey, this is a scorned man. His wife uh, had problems. And look at, uh, look at uh, what's he talking about. I have a 30-year restraining order against me right now. Now, very early on, within the first six months, uh, my two children, Cindy and Mike, we, I got in touch with Cult Awareness in Chicago at the time. They were still in business before Scientology put them out of business. And I got in touch with them, and they were very helpful. They, they, they connected me with people who, uh, who would give me information about what was going on. I, flew I had to stop it right there. Uh, at that time when we were doing this interview, I had no idea what the Cult Awareness Network was about. But the problem, what happened with Phil, was that when he contacted them, they work on the side of the Vatican. Remember the Cult Awareness Network was the one that brought the Tony Alamo ministry down? It was working with the people together where they would take these kids and brainwash them. So you can see as the years go on, we learn a little bit more. But Phil, at this point, let me just make it clear. I did a number of interviews with him. And he's very, uh, he was very meticulous, and he basically did so much research into this fraud of Medjugorje, and that's how it really occurred. We were talking, and you get lost in the weeds here a little bit, but I think on one of my other interviews, uh, what really happened, she went to, they went to Medjugorje. He was a very devout Catholic, and I think they targeted him a long time ago. And when they went to Medjugorje, that's when Nilika got his, dirty rotten fangs into his wife and they put them together in this kind they put his wife with all these nuns and separated the 
her from her husband and then started feeding all these lies that he was cheating on her, that he was never, you know, everything when their marriage was a fraud. They've been, you know, and you got to get away from this man. He's not holy, etc., etc. And in the process, what happens is that they get all of his assets. She had given the assets to them. Yes, many, much of the money through her went to the this uh, Bishop Nilica. I think he passed away a number of years ago. But I'm sure the Jesuits have another guy there to take care of him, uh, to take care of the same thing. Now, Medjugorje is still there. Now, here's the real fraud. The Vatican is stating that they don't approve of Medjugorje, they, but they hold up, they don't say it's not official. What they do is they say, for years, we're researching it while they allow this bilking and all of this money to be collected into their coffers. Pretty good organization, right? Now, whether they say it's fraud or not, look at all the money they've pocketed. And there'll be another one. They're going to put Mother Mary up in another tree somewhere. And let me tell you something. Phil started to understand this fraud of these apparitions, but he still believed that there was some truth in the Vatican and the Catholic Church and that some of them were real. So at that particular point in 2006, I remember doing the interview and I I, I realized, because I realized at the time, that they were no good. This that, that Phil should realize that don't hold out any hope that even Fatima was no good. But I never pushed him that far because he was going through so much. I mean, this guy lost everything. He was on the run. They they had charged him with crimes in Alabama. They charged he had to flee across to the Caribbean. I mean, it's incredible. Now, John Levy, who's a friend of mine, was his attorney for a while, helping him, and so through John we used to communicate with him. And the story is incredible. I haven't talked to Phil in years, and I hope he's, he's an older man. I hope he's still alive, but I'll check it out. Let's get back to Phil Kronzer for the last eight minutes. Philadelphia, with documents what I had, I had very little at the time. And I went to Philadelphia and had a meeting with a guy by the name of Dave Clark in a hotel. We spent about three hours together. I told him what I had, and he said, there's no question, your wife's, your wife's under my control. She's in the cult. Dave Clark is one of the best uh, exit counselors uh, that, 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 that ever came along. He's taken them out of the Moonies and everywhere. And uh, where's your wife as we speak today? She lives in Foster City with the same woman, Marcia Smith. And you said now they, earlier you made this made mention that they consider, uh, you're considered crazy and yep. that your other children now have turned against you. How's that done? Well, it, it, it took a little time. Uh, what happened is, uh, in, in, let, let me let me back up a little. Okay. In September, in September of '94, uh, we uh, our, our attorney said, uh, "By the way, we'd like a hundred thousand in cash." And I told my accountant, I said, "Well, tell them so would I, because I was still running businesses and we had lines of credit, and I wasn't about to borrow money to give them a uh, hundred thousand dollars cash." So. Uh, what happened is they took Artie to uh, Rome and to the Holy Land with Bishop Nielitsa and about 20 people, and she was supposed to pay the, for the whole bill. And uh, I found out from a priest later on in Denver that, yes, Bishop Nielitsa had asked her for $80,000, and that's what the $100,000 was for. Well, when I said no, that's when they took off the gloves, and that's when the fireworks started. Then about a year later, in May of '95. My two children, Cindy and Mike, were getting fed up with the cat and mouse game that was being played. They couldn't see their mother so two weeks from Tuesday. I can see her for lunch at 2 in the afternoon, that type of arrangements. And then she always had her cell phone with her because they were watching her like a hawk. Figuring, and in fact, the truth is we did have people working with us in Cult Awareness Network. We were going to do a family intervention. Uh, we had one shot at it where... Uh, uh, we, we rented a couple of cabins up in the mountains near Lake Tahoe by Truckee, and we got her to, she was agreed to go. We had it all set up. The kids convinced her to go, and I had the 2D programmers coming out from Baltimore, and we were praying for a blizzard, and by golly, at the last minute, she came up with laryngitis, and uh, we had a leak. Somebody found out about it. That's why, they, the, that's why we couldn't get her to come. So, we had her out at that time. Right. Now, what kind of uh, mind control... Uh, programs have they used on her that you're aware of? Well, we have information that they're using electronic devices 
in Medjugorje and holograms, okay? We, we, you know, to, trying to pin this down and prove it is very difficult, but we've seen enough, we got enough information from different sources that, that they do use the, this electronic uh, mind control thing. The Russians developed this stuff a long time ago, and it, it, it has been used. And, and holograms to, to, to make the people think that they're seeing visions. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, Father Malachi Martin, you've heard the name? Oh, of course. Sure. Okay, well, see, um, I never met Father Malachi Martin, but we gave him a video. It was called Visions on Demand, which was the first video that these people in England made, and I got involved with them later. And my e. Michael Jones was on that video about, about Medjugorje. And we sent it to Father Malachi Martin, and he sent us a postcard back saying, uh, uh, thank you and congratulations for exposing the hoax of Medjugorje. I declared it satanic from the beginning. And he gave us permission to uh, use that quote. And we did. And boy, when we did, we were threatened with lawsuits from several different sources. So there's something about Medjugorje that's much bigger than I don't even know about yet. It, it's just uh, there's something huge there. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, first of all, there's a ton of money involved. Franciscans were involved in their own bank, but you know, back to this Lopez thing, uh, in, in, in May of 94 at, at Notre Dame, Bishop Nielitsa can celebrated mass with um, uh, Tomislav Pervan, who was at the time the provincial of the uh, uh, Franciscans of the Mostar province, which controlled Medjugorje. Now, these people will deny that they had, that they had a relationship, but Nielitsa was in and out of Medjugorje uh, regularly since we know for sure around 1994, excuse me, 84, 1984, before my, my wife and I even went there. And of course, you, you know, you remember the murder of uh, Roberto Calvi? Of course. Okay, yeah. Calvi was hung under the bridge in 82, the uh, Blackfriars Bridge. Yeah, now just for our listeners, Roberto Calvi was the head of Bank of Ambrosiano, who uh, took a dive when the Vatican was involved with the Vatican Bank scandal. Uh, millions and billions of dollars were uh, uh, laundered and stolen. Uh, Calvi had information, and uh, many of the people involved in this scandal thought he was going to blow the whistle on him, so he was found dead. And that trial is now finally uh, going on, uh, started a year ago in Rome. Go ahead. But yes, and then also connected with the Calvi case, Nielitsa was running around with a briefcase uh, trying to, with about $3 million cash in it trying to buy Kelvin's briefcase because it had contained all the information with the Swiss bank accounts. And, and that's how he got involved with, with that situation. I, don't, I still don't know what the real connection in Medjugorje was with that, but we knew that Nielitsa was close, closely related to a guy by the name of Lena, who was a, a, a heavy-duty drug dealer, and another guy by the name of uh, Gelli. Yeah, Jelly. Jelly. He was the head of P2 Masonic Lodge. <laughs> right. He was, uh, he was involved with all those characters. Yeah, and Jelly was also connected uh, to the Reagan administration in many different ways. Uh, so anyway, this thing goes deep and uh, down and dirty. So let's go uh, Nilica. Here's this name coming up. Uh, many may think a benign Jesuit priest. Uh, what else have you found out about him in this last minute? Then we'll get back to well, you. Well, more. Then later on, later on in the investigation, let's, let's get away from my family situation here. But by by 1997, uh, early 97, we did a complete expose on Teresa Lopez. I found her uh, her her last fifth husband, Jeff, in in Reno, Nevada, and I went up to see him, and and he gave me all kinds of documentation. That's when I got involved with E. Michael Jones, and I, I furnished him with the information. And then Jones and I started working together on his book called The Medjugorje Deception, which he wrote. And my story is in there. The, everything that happened to me is in that book and, and a lot, lot more. Uh, so then in, in, in late 97, the same people in Liverpool, England, who had done the first video called Visions on Demand uh, against Medjugorje with E. Michael Jones got in touch with me and they wanted me to, to work with them. And I went to Liverpool in, in November of 97 and I met up with a guy by the name of Maurice Alexander and uh, another guy, a journalist by the name of Jeff Pickett, who had just come on the scene at the time, and uh, I, I didn't know either one of them uh, before that. And in early 98, um, uh, we, we ended up going to Medjugorje to, get, to do some more filming for another film. But when Pickett came to California in late 97, I'll, I'll get into that and I'll tell you what happened there. That's, that's the connection with Kelby and, and uh, that situation. Okay, well
Okay, we're going to come back to that tomorrow. We're all out of time here on the Investigative Journal. Thanks for putting up with what happened in the first hour in the last couple of minutes. Uh, and anyway, come back tomorrow. We'll get more with Phil Kronzer and a lot more on the Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.